Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Nicole Byram and I'm a registered dietitian with Celiac Canada. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about celiac disease and vaccines, a very um, interesting topic and very appropriate for this time of year when we're all about to get our, our next possibly COVID vaccine or flu shot. Um, so we are very, very lucky tonight to be joined by Dr. Um, Inez Pinto Sanchez, uh, who is a gastroenterologist and clinical nutrition specialist and an active medical staff in the gastroenterology division at McMaster University and Hamilton Health Sciences, where she provides consultation services in the area of gastroenterology and nutrition. Uh, Dr. Pinto Sanchez is the director of the Adult Celiac Clinic at McMaster University and leads the intestinal failure and calorimetry clinic and provides support to the HPN program. Her clinical and research interests include the diagnosis and treatment of different gastrointestinal inflammatory conditions with a focus on celiac disease and nutrition in chronic inflammatory GI conditions. Whew, that was a mouthful. Um, a very, a very, uh, a very, uh, we're very, so very lucky to have you here. Um, Dr. Pinto Sanchez is also part of our Professional Advisory Council here with Celiac Canada. So we are um, so lucky to have her on that and I'm honored to introduce her tonight. So thank you, Dr. Pinto Sanchez for being here and for uh, presenting this topic to us. Before I hand over the reins, I just wanted to let everybody know that the Q&A is where we will gather the official questions that I will ask Dr. Pinto Sanchez at the end of the at the end of her presentation portion. So the chat we're going to leave it for um, visiting and casual ca casual respectful conversation and I'm seeing people from Nova Scotia, Linda of course. Hi Linda. Um, I hope that you're having a wonderful time in Rome. Um, thank you for joining us so late at night or early in the morning for you. Um, we've got people from Ontario, Somebody else from Vancouver, Grand Prairie, Winnipeg, Hamilton, uh, more from Vancouver, Montreal, from all over, from Newfoundland. So we are, and from Ottawa, we are coast to coast. Um, so I'm so happy to, uh, to, to be able to, you know, share this presentation across all of Canada. So on that, I will pass it over to you, Dr. Pinto Sanchez. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nicole, for the very nice introduction and also for inviting me to discuss this topic, which is something that we uh, address, at, we should address at every visit uh, with our patients. And it's so important because we can prevent diseases there and especially in celiac disease. So the idea of uh, today's, uh, you know, talk uh, discussion is to review what is the evidence and common questions uh, that our patients ask is, is celiac disease at increased risk of infection? And, and if yes, which ones? And what vaccines are recommended to prevent infections in celiac disease? And are celiac disease at increased risk of vaccine side effects? And this is something that I've been asked a lot. And we did a study on that, I will show you there. And then is there any response to vaccines different in celiac disease compared to someone that has not celiac disease or someone from the general population? We're going to address all these questions today. So just to introduce um, the topic, um, as you know, uh, there are different mechanisms involved in celiac disease. So celiac disease is triggered by gluten, but there are other role players there that induce this and um, participate in this immune reaction. As we know, we, we require the genetic, we have the, the immunity, but we do have also the gut bacteria and uh, uh, that is very important. And viruses and bacteria has been very, very important in the mechanism of inducing um, uh, immunity in celiac disease. So as we know, these bacteria viruses are involved also in this immune reaction, but also in the loss of tolerance to, um, to gluten or to other food components. This is why viruses and bacteria have been involved uh, for a long time in a celiac disease. And um, as in addition to the, the role of these bacteria and viruses, we have also other function of uh, some organs in uh, celiac disease that may not be working as, as good as we expect and that can lead to um, increased infections. For example, uh, we know that celiac disease can be associated with hyposplenism 
or functional asplenia. I know that this is a difficult word, but what this means is that this is, there is a reduced function of the spleen. And this is in, in 20 to 80% of the cases. And the reason of this variability is because depending on what population we're talking about, if it is a person with just celiac disease or someone that has other autoimmune conditions or someone that has a complicated disease, when that in, in, in another autoimmune conditions, it will be closer to the 80. In someone that has celiac disease, it will be closer to the 20 or 30% of, of, uh, of a risk for having this spleen dysfunction. And the problem is that um, this spleen, as you will see in the, in the figure on the right, the spleen is an organ that is located on the left side of the rib cage, just below, uh, below, uh, uh, the, just, uh, 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 below the, uh, sorry, above the, the stomach and just below the, the rib cage and the diaphragm. And the spleen participates, is kind of a filter, participates in, uh, uh, in part of the immune system and filters virus and bacteria and filters blood as well. That's why when the spleen is not functioning properly, so then we have increased risk of infections. So um, especially of the, these risk of infections are increased uh, when the spleen is not working properly for specific bacteria that are encapsulated. For example, these uh, bacteria that are related to pneumonia, to meningitis, to uh, influenza uh, and, and, uh, uh, and and that's why people with celiac may have increased risk of infections. So celiac disease has been uh, known to have increased risk of infections um, uh, related to viruses, influenza and pneumonia. So there has been long lasting association of increased viruses and the consequences in celiac disease. And also more recently, since the pandemic started, we started questioning whether what's the, there was a link or increased risk of COVID. So for COVID specifically, as you, you may know, because uh, we, did, we have been working a lot with Celiac Canada in a collaborative study um, uh, looking into this association, um, but not only us, other, other groups from Italy, for example, this is the, one of the first studies that uh, I'm showing you uh, from Italy that shows that um, there was uh, not increased risk, not much increased risk of COVID in people with celiac disease. And there was not much hospitalizations for uh, spe specific for celiac. So with that question, we did an international study uh, with the support of, uh, we, we helped recruiting from uh, uh, Celiac Canada, and we in different, we recruited people around the world. And uh, the good thing is that we found that there was no increased risk of COVID. So COVID infections were not more frequent in celiac disease compared to the general population. And um, that, that initial study that uh, 17,000 people were recruited in the first part of the pandemic, but then after that, we did a follow-up study collaborating with a group of Argentina, which was one of the biggest proportion of uh, patients recruited. And they did a second survey uh, like, to uh, evaluate the risk and that risk didn't change. So that's very good. It's very good news. The perception of the risk decreases with the time, uh, but this is COVID. Um, and then what we know is that what there is increased risk is not, uh, even though COVID is not increased risk, there is increased risk of pneumonia. And this, there has been several studies uh, published uh, until now from Sweden, from the UK and uh, from Sweden, uh, three of them. And um, with, as you will see there in that table, involves different type of populations, patients, uh, outpatients admitted to the hospital, and also general population. And as you will see there, all these are populational studies involving several thousand uh, uh, people, and uh, compared to several thousand uh, people or several thousand hundred people uh, as the controls. And all these studies have, uh, are showing consistently that the risk of pneumonia is increased at least double in celiac disease compared to someone that is not celiac. And um, this, this is a result of a meta-analysis that pulled all these studies together. And uh, this is uh, not happens only in adults, but also happens in children, because even though they were not as high as adults, they are still have an increased risk of pneumonia infections. So 
we talk about the infections and we talk about virus infections in celiac, we talk about uh, pneumonia in celiac, and this is where we open the topic to uh, vaccines. And vaccines are a way of preventing these diseases because many of these infections are preventable by vaccines. So as we know, there are multiple vaccines available to protect against more than 26 infectious disease. And the list, that list that you're seeing there is not all the vaccines are available, but are the most frequent. And um, how the vaccines work? Well, the body, the body is exposed to a weakness or dead virus or bacteria, which is uh, the, the way that the vaccine is developed, depending on the way that is developed. And when it's exposed to this weakened virus or dead virus, then the body develops these immune cells or antibodies that will serve as a memory and defense for future exposure. So when the real virus comes, so then the body is prepared to defend and to fight the virus stronger. So, and this is important because vaccines help to protect not only the person, but also the community. And this is because when no one is immunized or no one is vaccinated, the disease is spreads very quickly. However, when some people are vaccinated, that helps to block some uh, spread out of the disease. And you can see how uh, much less people, the ones that are in red, are the ones that are not immunized. Even someone cannot be immunized, but the majority are vaccinated. That decreases the amount or the proportion of patients or people that are going to contract the disease. So there are different types of vaccines. And there are vaccines that are developed that are where the virus uh, is live, but diminish. So then diminish the, the, the what we call virulence. So the viral, virulence is what produces the disease. So it's a weakened virus. And examples of that is the MMR, like rotavirus varicella, and that usually requires one or two doses. There are other vaccines where the virus is inactivated. So the, vir the virus is uh, uh, there, but non-active. And usually is killed virus or bacteria. And that requires several boost boosters because that the, 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 immune, uh, the immunity developed after those vaccines when they are inactivated, they don't last like long, last long. So for example, those are vaccines, hepatitis, rabies, uh, or polio, those are, examples of inactivated virus or killed virus. There are other vaccines that are subunit um, that contain specific parts of the virus or, or specific areas uh, could be artificially developed uh, of those that mimic those viruses and uh, that those are the that, that specific parts of the virus that that are triggering the immune reaction and so that they take those specific parts and then they they uh, develop the vaccine with that. Um, for example, that uh, examples are Haemophilus influenza, uh, HPV or pneumococcus vaccine, some of them. And then there are other vaccines that they can, uh, toxoids that contain toxin that, that is made by the bacteria that re may require another booster as well, for example, diphtheria pertussis. And there are newer vaccines are mRNA that are artificially uh, specific RNA of the virus. So, these vaccines provide lifelong immunity. Uh, some of the vaccines provide lifelong immunity uh, from a single dose. Others, they require protection at other multiple doses. And others are needed to uh, frequently, for example, because if that, this virus change or mutate, then you need to develop a new vaccine. For example, what happens with the, with the flu shot or the, or the influenza virus. So <clears throat> that's why what we need to know is not all Vaccines are the same, not all viruses are the same, not all viruses behave the same way. And that's why it's important that immunization schedules are based on scientific evidence. So what is the scientific evidence of what is needed to do to ensure that vaccines are safe and effective? Well, you have different phases to develop a vaccine. Um, one, the phase one is usually in a small number of people, usually healthy volunteers, just to see if the vaccine is safe and if the vaccine works, and if there are very serious side effects that we should prevent, continue with that vaccine, um, and also how the dose is related with side effects. Then the second phase, that phase is, uh, the, you know, the vaccine passed that phase, so then we go to the second phase, and then there are multiple hundred uh, volunteers there. 
And um, the idea of uh, the, the questions that, that are answered with that phase is that what are the more common side effects and how the volunteers respond to the vaccine. And then phase three is with hundreds of thousands of volunteers, so it's a massive study, it's a very large study, and to see how people respond, the efficacy of the vaccine, and continue monitoring safety, safety always. So with that, there are multiple vaccines uh, um, uh, approved, and they are showing effective to prevent diseases, and they are part of a regular scheme for, for children and also for adults. But I'm not going to talk about vaccines in the general population because I'm not used to prescribe that. I'm not, family, not, not the, the, the expert there. Usually that's more for a family doctor. But what we are going to talk today is which vaccines are recommended in celiac disease. And uh, we know that uh, from that meta-analysis that I showed you before, pulling all these studies, that uh, the pneumococcal vaccination should be recommended because consistently those populational large studies are showing that people with celiac disease are at increased risk of pneumonia. And um, that recommendation is applicable to all age groups, um, uh, especially those who were not vaccinated as a child. So after that meta-analysis, there was um, um, another study from uh, involving 9,000 people from the UK, and they have identified that continued, you know, like that, that, that people with celiac disease has increased risk of pneumonia. And with that meta-analysis and that study, the British Society, Society of Gastroenterology updated the guidelines in 20 years ago, more than 20 years, 30 years ago. Well, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and um, they recommended vaccines uh, to, to, to vaccinate people with celiac disease against pneumococcal disease. And uh, however, these recommendations were not followed by other guidelines, and then they were not followed by most of the physicians. So then many of uh, people remain not unvaccinated despite recommendations. And there are inconsistencies across guidelines. Some of the US guidelines um, recommend uh, a vaccination to, against pneumococcal, and UK guidelines recommend vaccinations everyone with celiac disease and to get the pneumococcal uh, vaccine and then the booster at five years, depending on the vaccine type. And I will show you now. And we did a review a couple of years ago and showing this inconsistency in recommendations. But now, more recently, after these five years, there has been more consensus uh, that pneumococcal vaccines should be provided for celiac disease, as well as an influenza vaccine and more recently COVID vaccine after the pandemic. So there are several available vaccines. Um, uh, you will hear these names, um, pneumococcal conjugated vaccine, which is the Prevnar 13 or the Prevnar 20, and then the Prevnar 15, which is not available here in Canada, it's available in the US. And also there are there is a pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, which is uh, the, the Pneumovax 23, as you will see there. And the difference is that the, the amount of uh, serotypes of pneumococcal uh, bacteria, pneumococcus bacteria that covers. As you will see there, the Pneumovax 23 is the one that covers the most, the majority of them. Um, but there is no clear recommendations based on the evidence on which of these vaccines are more effective in celiac disease. So what we do is to follow general uh, public uh, guidelines recommendations. So initially, like a couple of years ago, Health Canada published uh, this in their website and it's available still there. I, I, I added the link for you. Um, recommending the Pneumovax 23, one dose, and then uh, to cover most of these uh, uh, bacteria, um, and then one, one dose and then one dose after five years. However, more recently, uh, uh, this guideline have been updated. And this is because the Pneumovax 23, even though it covers the highest number of serotypes, what happens is that the immunity fades after five years. So then you require booster and then another booster and then another booster. That's why the UK guidelines recommend this vaccine, but then a booster every five years. And that is costly because it's not covered by all the, you know, the, the, the OHIP in this case in Canada. So that's why the guideline had been updated by the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations. And more recently this year, they recommend the use of Pneumovar, uh, 
pneumovar A2020 as a single dose, because even though this covers a little bit less uh, numbers of uh, these bacteria, the immunity lasts way longer, so then people don't need to give a boost after booster after booster. And uh, of course, there are if you if you see that that website that I put there, there are the, is the, the amount of information is huge because there are special cases, the recommendations depending on if you have or you didn't have a previous dose and depending on the age. So that's why I always again, I'm not expert in, uh, in vaccine as I know immunologists or family doctor, I always suggest to discuss with the family doctors. Um, to see what is the best recommended based on previous immunization, other vaccines that you have in the past, and also age. Uh, and that's for pneumococcal vaccine. And another vaccine that is recommended uh, more consistently through guidelines is the influenza. So the, uh, this is the flu shot uh, to give it uh, annually. And also uh, some guidelines is not consistent, recommend shingles vaccine once uh, in celiac disease. But again, this is not consistent. So what about COVID vaccines in celiac? There are no specific studies uh, on like uh, efficacy and the long term. There were no specific studies. So the evidence suggests that people with celiac will be, uh, uh, there, will, there is no evidence suggesting that people with celiac will be more prone to adverse events or there will be any problems with the COVID vaccine. So that's why what is considered recommended across all these institutions for celiac disease is to follow general guideline recommendations based on a similar risk in the general population. So one of the problems that we have with vaccines when we recommend that to prevent diseases is that many people are not very keen to get the vaccines and they have there are some there is some hesitancy um, uh, especially in celiac disease. So this study that I'm showing you here that was published last year shows that People with celiac disease, um, uh, there was a large cohort uh, from Italy, and then they analyzed what vaccines people were receiving, and uh, three out of four people received the tetanus, there was no problem with that, half, less than half of them received the flu, even though it's recommended for almost the general population, um, and very little amount of people received the pneumococcal, which is the one of the most uh, highly recommended or more consistently recommended uh, very little meningitis and uh, one part of people did not remember what they received which is important and that's why I usually suggest to discuss with family doctors who have all the records so and what is also I want to bring to you is that 80 percent of people have a positive attitude as uh, towards vaccines and how to prevent infections and also how to improve prevent infections in the community uh, but 20% or one out of five had a kind of a, were reluctant uh, to, to get vaccines, which is a lot if we consider uh, as part of a population. And what are the most common reasons why someone may, may uh, refuse to get the vaccine or were maybe reluctant? Or, um, there are several myths. And um, one is that the vaccines may cause autism. And the, this myth came from a large study that was flawed and that was fraudulent and was found out later on that was uh, not based on a good research so that was retracted by the author and then the author was removed the medical license was revoked for, for this author so um and then other studies evaluating the link between vaccines and autism were never able to reproduce this or prove that there was any link so that's the fact is that there is no link at the moment uh, proven for uh, vac any vaccines that will cause autism so the second is that um, some people may say that it's better to space out vaccines using an alternate uh, alternative schedule. Some people, you know, from mouth to mouth may say, oh, don't give two vaccines or three vaccines at the same time, space out because, uh, especially in children, because they can, the immune system is not mature. And this is, this is a myth uh, because there are delaying this vaccine increase the time that the person will be susceptible and there is no evidence that spreading out will be better or will reduce any adverse event so then the fact is that um, we, we 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 don't want to spread out the vaccines we want to give it at a scheduled time and the proper time to prevent diseases the other myth is that vaccines cause disease that they are designed to prevent for example if you give a covid vaccine that will cause covid and that's that's almost uh, <laughs> impossible so inactivated vaccines cannot cause a disease and it was not unheard for that live vaccines will cause disease so yes 
someone can have symptoms when you give a vaccine and this is because of the stimulation of the immune system and that is a reality but it doesn't mean that that will cause a disease and the idea is that to stimulate the immune system so then you can develop those antibodies to protect when the when the real um, virus or bacteria comes then you are prepared for that and then the other thing is that um, that the, there is a greater harm from a vaccine than from the disease itself and usually that's not the case uh, because uh, the risk of infection are usually way greater than a, a vaccine and that's the whole idea of protecting against that, that, that disease. And severe, severe side effects that when we call severe side effects is we, we're calling a side effect that can um, send someone to an emergency or send someone to a ICU or, or cause death are extremely, extremely rare. Uh, related to vaccines and, and more often non unproven link or causation. So um, more likely this will prevent disease and will prevent a, a serious adverse events. Um, for instance, some of the adverse events uh, that were allocated with the COVID vaccines, they were 40 times higher with COVID than the vaccine itself. So again, always vaccines are meant to prevent disease and prevent adverse events. So it doesn't mean that they don't happen, adverse events can happen, but are way, way, way lower and the benefit of immunization far, far away the risk of immunization uh, always. And again, this has happened from research. And um, what happens with the specific with the COVID vaccine hesitancy, which happens in the, in the in, you know, when the during the pandemic, in this study that I showed you before, a year before, um, they uh, did a, um, a survey to celiac patients and most the majority of them were a uh, fear of adverse events. So because of that question, we had that question and we had a question coming from our patients, whether people with celiac disease were at higher risk of side effects of vaccines. And then um, from the pneumococcal vaccine, we know that most of the reported side effects are mild, usually pain in the injection site, some fatigue, some headaches, muscle aches that last very like a few days. And uh, they could be like a very temporary or sporadic fever, uh, very rare, 3% of the, of the recipients of vaccine. So they're pretty safe. Um, there are contraindications of vaccine, for example, when someone develops a, a, a hypersensitivity or anaphylactic uh, allergic. But usually these can be prevented and usually that requires a consultation with allergies and sometimes you can pre-medicate and prevent these reactions even. And what about the COVID vaccines uh, and the adverse events? So we had that question throughout the pandemic, whether, you know, when the vaccines came out, our patients were asking us, uh, are we having a greater risk of uh, adverse events uh, due to COVID vaccines? And we didn't know that. So then we did an international collaboration study, again, a highly supportive at Celia Canada, when we helped recruiting uh, uh, several thousand people with celiac disease and compared to non-celiac population and uh, through uh, 13 countries. And uh, that survey was translated in seven languages. And what we asked specifically was, of course, diagnosis and also um, uh, what type of vaccines, how many vaccines, and what symptoms uh, people had, both vaccines uh, in terms of adverse events, and then we analyze that data. And this is uh, uh, was presented in the uh, um, this year in um, DW, which is the largest inter uh, international gastroenterology conference. Uh, we recruited eight, almost 18,000 uh, participants across uh, 16 countries because they three countries joined later on. And um, majority were celiac disease, um, uh, 13,000 celiac compared with 4,000 non-celiac controls. And from then, the majority received the vaccines. And from people who didn't receive the vaccines, the unvaccinated reasons were fears of adverse events. This is the exact reason why we were doing the study. So what this is not published yet, so but I'm giving this heads up to you because it will be published soon uh, that patients with celiac report similar rate of minor uh, side effects and major adverse events post COVID vaccine compared to non celiac individuals. So there is no uh, reason to think that now that uh, there will be different adverse events uh, in a celiac compared to general population. After this study, uh, there was a more recent publication showing that people with celiac disease even though they were not at the increased risk of developing COVID, if they got COVID, they were hospitalized. And from those hospitalized, they 
those with, which were non-vaccinated had higher rates of complications. So unvaccinated people that were hospitalized were doing worse than those who were vaccinated. And that's very important because then you were seeing that the vaccines for COVID prevent complications um, uh, related to COVID. And so uh, in ICU, only people who were non-vaccinated vaccinated were admitted. There were no one vaccinated admitted to the ICU with celiac. And um, that's why this study also, which was published in a very good journal, Clinical Gastroenterology Hepatology, that's a US study, uh, was uh, concluded that the vaccination against COVID should be strongly recommended in patients with celiac disease as it is from non-celiac patients from the general population. So to answer the question, is the response to vaccine different in celiac disease? And this is a question I had all the time from my patients. And this is coming from studies uh, from hepatitis B vaccine, which is not one of the vaccines that is recommended particularly in celiac disease. But it's important for healthcare workers or for uh, because it's a, it's a vaccine that is provided in the community. So we know that Hep B vaccine has been around a long, long time. And of course, as all vaccines, there is a percentage of people who simply don't, don't respond for different reasons, immunity, genetic, um, and they don't develop immunity to the, to, the, to the disease, even though the vaccine is given. And there are many factors, as I mentioned. Um, there were in some hepatitis B, we're seeing that some people that smoking, that they were older age and obesity, or they have an immune, uh, other autoimmune conditions were less likely to react. And there were uh, studies showing that in celiac disease particularly have lower response to the hepatitis B vaccination, which is important for healthcare workers because <coughs> we need to protect our healthcare worker about Hep B, which is a transfer through blood. In a US study, uh, they published in two, 2003, and they found that, again, this is a small study, including only 19 people, that 13 out of them, um, uh, people with celiac disease, did not respond adequately to the vaccine. And this was the first study raising that, that um, concern on less uh, antibodies development. There were other studies published in 2007 and 2010 from Hungary and Turkey that found that people that were not responding were higher compared to um, in celiac disease compared to controls. 32% of people with celiac did not respond compared to 14% or 15% of controls. So, but as you will see there, that was not specific for celiac because there were 15% of people in the general population that did not respond to the, this vaccine for different reasons. So what is interesting is that celiac who were already been treated with gluten-free diet had a better immune response to the vaccine and also in another study in children who initially show no response or no develop of these antibodies, then when they were treated uh, with a gluten-free diet and then were revaccinated, then they developed these antibodies. So it seems that there could be some, uh, some decreased response in celiac that are more active when they're active. So it, it works to try again after treatment or when the celiac is more stable. So what about uh, vaccine response to the pneumonia vaccines? I show you about the hepatitis B, which is not the vaccine that is particularly involved, uh, that is recommended in celiac, but the pneumonia it is. So there is just one old study uh, that measured pre and post vaccination levels in very small proportion of pa patients with celiac disease. And they didn't see any, any, any decreased response to the antibodies. All people developed these antibodies. So it seems that the vaccines respond well in celiac disease, the pneumococcal vaccine. And what about the COVID vaccines? Well, also because of this, uh, the pandemic, there has been a strong and more studies developed uh, on COVID vaccine in celiac disease. And uh, one of the first studies that was published only with 100 patients, I don't say only with 100 because for the amount of population that has been vaccinated is a very small number. And um, they were saying that um, celiac may have decreased uh, the antibodies developed, uh, but if they got the Pfizer vaccine, they have they were more likely to develop antibodies. That was that initial study, but there were two other studies that were with larger number of patients, 120 and 300 from Italy and Norway that did not see any difference. So people with celiac disease, they respond very well to COVID vaccines and they develop antibodies in the same way than the general population. And more recently, I think to Nicole that she brought that up to me today it was just published right now. 
a big, 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 large study involving 20,000 people. And that study was done with a massive uh, campaign for vaccination in um, Israel. And what they show is that the COVID vaccine is a similar effective in people with celiac disease compared to the general population. So COVID vaccines and pneumococcal vaccines, people develop antibodies and they can have a good immunity, similar to the general population. So just to summarize, what we know and we don't know about vaccines in celiac. Um, celiac is associated with increased virus infections and pneumonia, and that we know there's a lot of data on that. There are multiple studies, population studies, studies that I show you, meta-analysis on that. So we know that that's a fact. And vaccines are effective to prevent infections, we know that. And um, the vaccines that are recommended in celiac more consistently, as I show you, there are inconsistencies in guidelines, but the most consistently recommended are pneumococcal vaccine influenza and now COVID, not in guidelines, but in the all the studies that I show you, uh, recommend follow guidelines from the public health guidelines. So we know that vaccines are safe in celiac disease, similar to a general population. And we know that only the hepatitis B, uh, there are a couple of studies showing decreased immunity. It doesn't mean that they are not effective. They are effective a little bit less than in a person without celiac. But the other vaccines that the ones that are recommended for celiac, which is the pneumococcal and the influenza and COVID are, are a similar uh, 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 efficacy than the general population. So what we need research is to understand what is the best vaccination scheme. And as I show you, uh, what's the best pneumococcal vaccine for celiac? Um, what is it that prevents better infections? That, that's research that needs to be done. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Pinto Sanjay. That was wonderful. As always, I learned a whole ton of information on these uh, presentations. So thank you so much. All right, let's get to questions. And just as a reminder, if anybody missed the very beginning, uh, questions are to go in the Q and A box along the bottom hand of your bottom part of your screen. Uh, let me see. I have got some questions. Okay. Um, anonymous attendee asks. Uh, thank you for sharing the information here. I received a diagnosis of celiac uh, at the age of 63 with no symptoms and no family history. High blood marker, but no evidence by scope. I'm wondering about the COVID vaccine and the studies that seem to show a relationship between COVID vaccine and the onset of new autoimmune, new immune, I, I'm assuming autoimmune diseases. Um, is there a relationship between these two? Yes, so thank you for that question. And that's the study that I show you from Israel, that large study that they call brought that up. It's exactly that case, <coughs> is celiac autoimmunity. Those were patients with celiac disease, so they were out with the celiac markers positive for, for, for celiac disease. So it seems that the COVID vaccine is similar effic effective in people with celiac autoimmunity, even though you don't, you know, there is no, um, uh, uh, inflammation in the gut than the general population. So that, that comes from, from that larger study. That's the latest evidence there. Um, Aaron asks why the increased risk of pneumonia in people with celiac disease, or if we don't know, is there a link or helpful resource that could explain this? Yes. So one of the, there are a couple of, the, the exact, the exact um, reason for that is unclear, but there are a couple of factors involved in that. One is the first one that I show you about the spleen. The pneumonia is caused by that bacteria, encapsulated bacteria, that should be cleared up or filtered by the, by the spleen, but because the spleen is not functioning properly in one third of the celiac patients, then this bacteria can more frequently uh, get into our system. So that's one. And then the second is that having an autoimmune disease that is active when the celiac is active and then you're fighting that predisposed to an open the door for other infections and pneumonia is one that is spread out throughout the community. So that's, that could be two reasons, you know, active disease and also the spleen not functioning properly. Okay, wonderful. I do see somebody is asking about access to these slides. And I just want to let everybody know that you will be getting a follow-up email um, with a link to our to this presentation that will be living on our YouTube channel. So yes, you will get a copy of this presentation. Um, anonymous attendee asks for pneumonia, is the risk lowered if the adult had pneumonia as a child? I had pneumonia as a 12 year old and was diagnosed with celiac disease in my mid twenties. Um, 
they probably they think they probably had celiac for longer, but was told they had IBS and was misdiagnosed. So is the risk lower, um, I guess, severity maybe of pneumonia if you had it as a child? Yeah, so I, and that's a good question as well, but um, um, what it's uh, known that the risk of pneumonia is higher if someone has previous history of other infections or other uh, uh, lung diseases. So perhaps if someone had just one episode of pneumonia but no underlying uh, uh, lung disease, the risk may be the same, but usually if the person has a predisposition for pneumonia, and a lung disease that can increase the risk of developing further pneumonia. So that's why someone that has a previous episode of pneumonia they, and, and, and lung disease are at high risk of higher risk of pneumonia. So I would say it's more higher than lower. Aliyah is asking where they, where people can find this graph about which vaccines you need throughout your life. Oh, they are available in Health Canada website. Okay. The one that the link that I that I, that I share there, you will see in the slides and Health Canada website. <coughs> and uh, the, uh, in fact, um, Health Canada website, they have a table that are, they don't look as nice as the one that I show you. These are from the CDC, the Central of Disease Control. Okay. Uh, but they are the same information and the tables are nicer in the CDC website. <laughs> Sorry, everybody will see I've got a cat who's decided to join in on the conversation. He's telling me that it's definitely time to stop working and why am I still sitting down? <laughs> he wants his dinner. Um, okay, anonymous attendee asks, what is the reason that people with celiac disease should have a, a influenza vaccine? I had a COVID booster and shot, a COVID shots and booster, but I sit on the fence about the flu shot as it may or may not work. As a young person, I feel that I could recover from the flu, but I'm putting other people at risk by not get, but am I putting other people at risk by not getting the flu shot? Yes. So um, the reason is because as I mentioned before, people with celiac disease are at increased risk of virus infection in general and uh, pneumonia. So the virus, one of the virus available and highly spread out are the flu and also uh, well now the COVID, right? So those are the two ones that are highly spread out. And if, he, if a, a person with celiac disease contracts those virus are at high risk of contracting virus, high risk of spread, spreading out those virus to others. So that's why uh, getting the immunization, it will confer, in, it, it prevent to get the, 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 the most severe, the most severe virus, which can lead you to consequences or complications. And also, if you're not contracting the virus or the most severe, you can decrease the spread out to the community. So both protects you and the community. Brenda's asking about risk of getting the shingles vaccine. She's 60 years old and wants to know a little bit more before she discusses it with her doctor. Yes, so the shingle vaccine is one of the vaccines that um, the, the rational, there is not much evidence and it, that's why it's probably not uh, widely uh, consistently um, uh, recommended across guidelines, but the rational for that is because of the spleen. So the, having the spleen function decrease, so then one of the, the uh, that can also contribute or increase risk of getting shingles. Um, this is one of the rationales for that, but again, it's not consistent with spread out. And the risk of vaccines, uh, the shingles vaccines are similar to uh, other vaccines. Again, severe adverse events are very rare, minor adverse events, which is pain in the in site of injection, you know, develop some uh, mild fever is, uh, is low, but it happens. And the problem is that I had patients who had shingles and it's very painful. So then uh, people prefer to have the vaccine, which is just once in life and not having shingles itself, right? So uh, that's the, the rationale for that. Um, okay, another question about pneumonia. Um, although the risk for people with celiac disease of getting pneumonia is higher, is the recovery rate lower or slower in people with celiac disease? So if the higher is, so the, the risk is higher, but what is the question? So can you repeat that question? I'm wondering is the severity of illness. 
Oh, I see. Uh, is, are I they, see. Uh, yeah. Is the severity of illness going to be higher, therefore recovery rate longer? I see. I see. There are not much, many studies on the severity of illness um, uh, of uh, pneumonia in celiac disease compared to non-celiac population. All these studies come from the databases, but they don't talk much about the severity of the illness. Okay. Yeah, so I have no like a very clear uh, answer whether it is more severe yeah. or like not. Hmm. Samantha asked something that you touched on in your presentation. Do you recommend taking the flu shot and COVID vaccine combined? It's offered in Ontario now. And should people consider, or should people consider separate vaccines? This is very, because I'm going for both of mine tomorrow. So um, I think you had mentioned that it was okay to have both together. Yes, it is okay to combine those, to get those at the same time, it is okay. Um, yeah. There is no reason to delay that. And there is no increased adverse events and the efficacy is uh, is pretty similar. It's pretty good. Yes. Super. And at what age should people get start getting a pneumococcal vaccine? Any age. The recommendations are any age. Um, in the general population, non celiac, the pneumococcal vaccine is given to kids like a very like a toddlers, and then is given to over sixty five years. But in celiac, because of these, uh, this risk is spread out throughout ages, a recommendation is at any age. Okay, excellent. Um, somebody's asking, this is a, a question that I've heard um, brought up before, and I, I'm, I'm going to ask it because I think it's representing a number of people, but the question is whether or not the COVID vaccine might trigger the onset of celiac disease or other autoimmune diseases. So... There is no evidence for that, so that uh, the vaccine can trigger celiac. However, um, COVID, as any other virus, as I showed you before, it may. So if you get COVID or infections, there are, there are studies showing that celiac disease um, can be triggered after a virus infection. So that stimulates the immune system that breaks out, uh, breaks the the, the, you know, like it make the, the, the gut more permeable and then that increases the, the, the breaks the tolerance to food. So in someone that has a genetic predisposition, it can, uh, can be a contributing factor or triggering celiac disease. Um, there is no yet, um, there was a suggestion of that, that COVID will trigger celiac disease. Uh, by one of the papers that was published on, on a stimulation of COVID in T cells, but uh, there is no evidence of increased celiac yet after COVID pandemic. And there is definitely no evidence that vaccines will trigger um, a more celiac disease. Okay. Um, now, this is an interesting question. Emily asks, is there is the susceptibility to, mo to pneumonia for all people with celiac disease, even if they adhere to a gluten-free diet? So a right. stable person on a gluten-free diet for, for let's say many years, are they still at increased risk? Right. So once uh, someone with celiac disease has the celiac non-active, um, the, 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 in theory, that decreases the risk of infections because the increased risk of infection happens when people have the immune system active, but also, um, but also we need to consider about the spleen function, right? So someone with celiac that has is very well controlled, but they the spleen is not working very well and has still hypospleism splenism, uh, or decreased spleen function may still be at risk of developing pneumonia. That's why uh, the recommendations are not differentiated and not not uh, not only for people who have celiac active are for everyone. Okay. Because we can, it's very tricky to discriminate uh, all, all these factors because it's not just the celiac active, celiac active, the spleen function, previous diseases, you know, previous infections, and all these factors that contribute there. An anonymous attendee is asking about the Hep B vaccine, um, saying that students uh, across Canada, generally in grade six, 11 years old, receive the Hep B shots at school. Um, they received this shot in the 90s, but was not diagnosed with celiac disease until mid-20s. Would they need to go for a booster? So what I would suggest is to check with the doctor the antibodies and to see if there is immunity against Hep B. 
And if the immunity is not there, then to get another booster now that they are treated. This is what is recommended. And if the immunity is there and the antibodies are there, it's, it's quite, like I said, a very simple test that is done, uh, can be done in the community as well. Uh, if the immunity is there, you don't need to get another shot. Okay. Someone is asking about a document. Um, what document would be best to bring out to your GP uh, to, in order, I think, to um, let them know that they would need the, the pneumococcal vaccine maybe before the age that is otherwise recommended? Um, what could somebody bring to their doctor to let them know that because they have celiac disease, they'd like to get the pneumococcal vaccination, even if mm. they're five? That's a good good question, because I usually give I, uh, my patients, I when I see my patients, I send the family doctor in my letter these uh, recommendations uh, there, and then usually we communicate with the family doctor if there is any question. Uh, again, the family doctor is the most uh, appropriate person to recommend the vaccines because they have your history, which vaccines you have, when you have it, what type of vaccines, what uh, age, you know, like all the other factors involving to make decisions on which type of vaccine is better. But you're right, many of the family doctors, they are not aware that celiac requires. So then in our notes, I send that to a family doctor. But if um, for someone that is not following this clinic, I follow, follow it somewhere else, um, there are uh, guidelines that um, the, the celiac guidelines that recommend vaccinations in celiac disease. That's a, the very recently posted guideline. I think it's a, Celiac Canada in their website have the celiac, access to the celiac guidelines there, right? There is a link. Um, and also we can talk to, um, to, to the PAC, to our professional advisory board to do a, a statement there so that you can print out and send it to, to your doctor to help. Be, that would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that would be helpful for everybody. Um, somebody just wanting a bit of clarification on receiving this shingles vaccine. Should people with celiac disease, there's two people asking. I think just clarification. So shingle vaccine is not as widely recommended. It is not the, again, if we need to, what I what we recommend is pneumococcal vaccine. We recommend influenza and COVID. And we discuss shingle. If the person, again, it's a, it's a possibility that you get, ching, uh, that you get shingles and you want to prevent that, then you need to get the, the vaccine. But it's not a consistent recommendation. That's why it's not someone that will say, yes, you, you should. It wouldn't be part of the, the, the suggested. Not part of the. The priority for recommendations. Right. Okay. If you want to get and if you can get, that's fantastic because that will prevent shingles and it's just one dose. But it's not the priority for recommendations. Okay. Sue is asking, um, and I think this must be an experience that she has had. Someone who has celiac disease has had COVID and the COVID vaccine. Could this cause hearing loss? Have you ever heard of that before? Never heard of hearing loss, um, but I will look into that. Okay. It's not within the reported adverse events, and it's not, I didn't see that in the adverse event uh, described, but I will look into that. Okay. And Sharon is just asking if you have active celiac disease. So it sounds like she's newly diagnosed. She's actively um, trying to recover. Is it safe to get the vaccine even when you're sick? Yes, even more. Yes. Even so more. it's important if, if your celiac is active to get the vaccines, because this is the the time when the celiac is active and when the immune system is active is when it opens the door for, for more infections, right? So Linda's just pointing out that she doesn't think there's a list of vaccines on the celiac website. So I can, uh, yeah, I don't know. Is that what you were saying, Dr. Pinto Sanchez, that there's a link to, to the recommended vaccinations? I think, no, no, no. No, it's not the list of vaccinations. It's uh, the guidelines for celiac, the, the, the most recent Management. guidelines for celiac disease. Yes. Yeah. That is where it recommends vaccination for pneumococcal vaccine. And there is a whole section on, on pneumococcal vaccine vaccination, uh, vaccination for celiac disease. So I think there is a link to the guidelines. So we can print and send it to the doctor. But again, I think the easiest for, for our people is to probably if we do a statement there. And, and bring this information. Much. So then it's one page that the, you know, everyone can print and bring to the doctors. 
yeah, we definitely do have the management of celiac disease there. Um, yeah, good, good to clarify that. And Sandra's asking, um, do you recommend teeter tests to understand if we are vaccinated against some diseases before getting the vaccination? So I guess that's checking your immunity. Um, usually, so the immunity you develop only if you get vaccinated. So, for example, for, you're not. Uh, we're not checking immunity for for uh, for flu. We're not checking immunity for uh, for pneumococcal vaccines. That's not recommended. The only immunity that you check is the hepatitis V, and um, there is that specific antibody that you develop only if you develop if you got the vaccine. You will not develop that if you don't get the vaccine. So there is no point of checking uh, immunity if you were not vaccinated. Okay, wonderful. All right, well, that is our questions for tonight. So thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the evening. And Dr. Pinto Sanchez, thank you so much for, for sharing your, um, your brilliance with us tonight and all the information that we need to know about vaccines and celiac disease. And everybody, you will be getting a follow-up um, email with all of with this presentation and a few other links that we can share. We'll make sure that that management link is in that email so that you can see it. And then next month, don't forget to sign up for our, our annual conference is, is next month and it's filled with lots of exciting presentations. So please check out www.celiac.ca for the full lineup of our, um, our November conference. So I look forward to seeing everybody there. And I thank you again, Dr. Pinto Sanchez for uh, joining us this evening. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you very much, everyone, for your fantastic questions. Okay, good night, everybody. Bye-bye.